Hey, welcome everybody to the next installment of Conversations That Matter. So this is a every other month conversation that we have as Ardmore Baptist Church. It's an opportunity for us to kind of open up dialogue about some issues that maybe are uh, you know, con sometimes controversial in culture, but not always controversial, sometimes just necessary, um, which that's where I would qualify tonight's conversation. So uh, tonight, my guest is Terrell Carter. Terrell and I have been friends for many years. Our paths have crossed a number of times. Um, Terrell is a pastor, a professor, and administrator in higher education. He's a visual artist. That's his art behind him, by the way. Um, he is a former police officer for the city of St. Louis, Missouri. Um, his writing specializes in addressing issues of race and race relations, especially within the church, within community, police and community relations. In fact, last time we had you, I think that's what we really focused on. Uh, organizational leadership, interpersonal communication. Um, in addition to his work in higher education and law enforcement, Dr. Carter has two, he served two nonprofit organizations as executive director, and he's an author of multiple books. Um, he just hasn't had a new one come out that we'll have to have him back to talk about that one. Um, but he also writes for The Word and Way, for Faithfully, for Pathios.com, for the Baptist Center for Ethics. He's a prolific writer, but more than anything, he is a, he is a, he's a good person. He's a good person. He's a fantastic <laughs> preacher. Uh, he's a good friend. <laughs> You give my daughter to say yes to either one of those, sir. I'll believe you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not your daughter. <laughs> so thank you so much, Terrell, for being here. And so for anybody joining us, I uh, want to remind you that uh, you, know, you can ask questions in the comments. I'll be monitoring those as we meet tonight. Um, and then I will also upload this video onto YouTube later if you want to share it with any folks after that. So the book that we're talking about is called Healing Racial Divides, Finding Strength in Our Diversity. And before we actually get to the content of the book, I, you know, you'll notice, I mentioned this earlier, that behind Terrell is actually the, the cover of the book. And that's not, he didn't just steal that image off Google. Uh, Terrell, tell us about what, what, what is this cover and where'd this come from? And tell us about the project that this came from. So the book uh, cover, uh, I created three separate pieces of artwork to be considered for the book cover. And the cover is what it is, but the images that are part of the background to my Zoom uh, position is one of the other images that was not accepted as the cover art. So I've been a, an artist since I was, as long as I can remember, when I was in kindergarten, the first grade, um, I saw some drawings that my father did and wanted to be like my dad. So I decided I was gonna be an artist. And so I've been drawing and creating uh, since I was you know, very, very small and have been blessed to exhibit my artwork all throughout the United States. I've exhibited overseas as well. I'm currently uh, represented by a, a gallery in the city of St. Louis. And so uh, when I submitted the manuscript and we began to talk about book covers, you, for me, it was a no brainer to say, hey, can I have the opportunity to at least try to contribute uh, you know, some ideas to the cover? And the point was to um, create images or to show images that you know, show the commonality of all human beings, regardless of color regardless of all these other things so my artwork is always very abstract figurative uh, and also very you know bright vibrant colors again I want that to represent any person in humanity for the most part uh, and so that's where the, the images come from yeah so you know you I first read this book when it, when it first came out which was in 2018 mm -hmm. And, you know, not much has happened since then in the world, <laughs> obviously, you know, no, nothing's really gone on in the past uh, three years. No, a ton of stuff has, has changed. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, you wrote this book on racial issues in 2018, not at all aware of, you know, how prevalent and how prescient this conversation would be even, you know, 
you know, just in the past few months even. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious about anybody who's read the book. This is really geared towards those folks, but is there anything you change? Is there anything you change from the book? Uh, no, there would not be anything that I would change. I wrote it from a place of uh, a desire to truly help. Um, and I'm going to say some things I hope your viewers understand or give me a few moments to, to make sure that I'm speaking clearly. So obviously, I'm African-American. And I wrote this book um, after Michael Brown was shot and killed. And so for some of your viewers, they don't know that I'm a former police officer from the city of St. Louis. And I was a police officer for five years, which in some people's minds may not mean a lot, but for me, it was extremely formative to, the, to who I am, not just as a man, but even as a Christian, because I got to see how the police in St. Louis at least operated. And what I found very quickly uh, was that policing is not about helping people in a traditional sense. Policing is about protecting that system and rewarding the people that operate within that system. I always tell this story that uh, for five years, I was never told to go out and help somebody or to make somebody's life better. Instead, I was told, make sure that you're protecting yourself, make sure you're protecting your partner and don't do anything stupid to get in trouble. Um, another example is, you know, I was 23 years old when I became a police officer and I used to work secondary. And what that is, is a part-time job where you work, you wear a uniform, or you may not wear a uniform, but you have all your police powers and you, you know, you're using your police powers to protect a particular business, whatever. And I had a sergeant who used to not get angry with me, but like, why are you working secondary? Well, I need, I want to make some extra money. I'm young, you know, young family, all those different things. He's like, well, why don't you just arrest people? And you can make all the overtime you want. You wouldn't have to work secondary. And I'm like, wait a minute, what are you telling me that I should you know, look at arresting people and inconveniencing people or whatever, just so I could line my pockets and make my life better. That's the system that is policing, at least in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this book, uh, Healing Racial Divides, and right after Michael Brown was shot and killed. And the reason why I wrote it is because I had several white Christian friends who would come to me and say, hey, can you help us understand what's going on? Why are Black people always so angry? Why don't they just do what they're told? Why can't they just get along? And it was amazing to me, or I was always stunned when Christians would ask me that question because it came from a place of, you know, literally just being uninformed about what other people's life experiences are. And the world that I operate in, you know this, is I am one of a small, I'm going to use the word minority, I am one of a handful of <laughs> African Americans, not just in leadership, but it's a traditionally white context. And their experiences are completely different from what my experience is. And so, again, I wanted to honor these questions that my friends, or not even friends, some of them were people on the opposite side of the road for me, but I wanted to engage in a legitimate conversation with them to help them understand your life experience is this, but my life experience and so many other people's life experiences have been this, and you are completely unaware. And so how do I help make you aware in a way that doesn't come across like I'm threatening you or trying to make you feel bad or whatever it is? Because one of the things I've learned is when you talk to white Christians about these things, um, you have to, and again, I want this to come across in a way that is respectful. You have to do it in a way that doesn't make them feel like they're being blamed for anything. One of the things that I consistently hear is, well, I didn't own slaves. My family didn't own slaves. Well, that's a good thing, but you're also missing the point that you have had certain opportunities or your family lineage has had certain opportunities that my family didn't have. And what does that mean for where each of our family groups or us as individuals are in life? Yes, I may have achieved certain things. I may have earned degrees. I may have whatever. But that doesn't, even with those things, I'm still behind in many ways. I'm behind you because of what it means to be a white male in this society versus what it means to be a black male in this society. And that's not me hating on you. That's not me saying there's anything wrong with you. There's not me I'm not saying that you've done anything wrong. It's just addressing what our 
cultural context is, what the history of our nation is, and how people are viewed, and then how do we navigate that? Yeah, I've heard it. I've heard it said before that you know the 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 goal for racial reconciliation is that white people should recognize the privilege that we have, but then want that privilege for everybody. Uh, you know. So I, I'm trying to, again, this is, so I, I know I can speak freely with you because we're friends, <laughs> but I'm trying to, I'm, I'm even trying to develop a language because there are people who will even push back against that and say, like, how, why are you trying to hold me accountable for something I never was involved in in the first place? I've worked just as hard as you. My life has been just as rough as yours has been. Nobody has given me anything. I didn't grow up with a silver spoon in my mouth. And all those things may be true, but we have to acknowledge that when it's all said and done, if both of us are in front of a judge, a judge is going to probably, and this is not my opinion, this is the statistical, excuse me, statistical data. If you and I have committed the same crime, a judge is going to hand down vastly different judgments based on your whiteness and my blackness. Hmm. Or we go to a job interview, we just submit our resumes and my name is Terrell Carter and your name is Tyler Tankersley. Well, your name's probably not a good example. Because, it's not, it's right. not. No. Uh, but, you know, Jim Smith, they're more than likely going to yeah. give that Jim Smith uh, resume a look versus a Terrell Carter because that name is familiar and safe to them versus the Terrell Carter. I mean, these are the things that have been ingrained in our society, whether we realize it, whether we like it, whether we understand it or not. And again, that's not saying that any one person or individual or group is even bad but it is the history of our nation. And so again, the book was written to try to help people who may not have ever even thought about it to learn some of the history of what our nation is and then how it has affected, and not just our nation writ large, it's specifically the church. Yeah. What part has the church played in this whole process? Uh, and what does that mean for us moving together in the, into the future as one, one body of, of God? Yeah, I feel like that... You know, I feel like that th this topic can make people uncomfortable and that sometimes in their discomfort, which this you address this in the introduction of the book, sometimes in the midst of their discomfort, they kind of push back against honestly talk about race at all. Yeah. And instead, they sort of embrace this sort of uh, ethereal like, well, why can't we all get along? Yeah. Or you'll hear people say things like, well, I don't even. I don't even think in terms of race. I don't see in terms of race. And so, you know, how do you, and, and I know, I know your heart. I know that the end goal for you in all of this is unity and strength. But what I hear you saying is that unity and strength are not possible by ignoring these other factors. And so, you know, in your own life, how, how have you tried to help people to move beyond you know, obviously, yes, we all want to get along, but we can't just jump there immediately. Right. So number one, or one of the simple things is to acknowledge that something is going wrong and that it's not just black and brown people being lazy. It's not just black and brown people being uncooperative. It's not just black and brown people not getting along with other people. We can ask the question, why does it seem like law enforcement has these type of interactions with this group of people versus how they traditionally or, you know, in a typical sense, have interactions with other people groups? Um, and again, that requires us to, to acknowledge our own preconceptions about other people. So I wrote another book called Police on a Pedestal, Responsible Policing in a Culture of Worship. And in that book, Again, that was written to white Christians as well. I give the history of how the police, uh, how police action was formed in St. Louis. And I use that as an example because that's where I'm from. That's where I served as a police officer. And the history is that policing started as a way to protect white settlers from Native Americans who were trying to regain the land that had been stolen from them. That's not a political statement. That's a statement of just pure history. And then it morphed into something different in order to control 
either freed slaves or escaped slaves. And mo many of us understand that and know that, but there are several of us who don't even know that. The point is, if we don't even recognize or understand that that's part of the history of the systems that we now take as normal, what does that mean? What does that mean for that to be part of the DNA of the systems that we have in place? So the, one of the first simple things is to say, all right, um, when I'm learning this information or when somebody else is trying to share this information with me, I don't have to take it personal. They're not attacking me. They're not accusing me. They're just talking about the history and I have the opportunity to try to understand what that history means and to try it, number two, to see this from their vantage point. Uh, one of the things I say in the introduction to the Healing Racial Divides book is, again, whenever you start talking about race with white people, especially white Christians, the, they want to turn it off because it makes them uncomfortable and they don't have to talk about it because I, I don't want to say they have the power. That's, that, that sounds like a us versus them and that's not it, but they don't have to talk about it. And if we push it, if somebody like me they or someone else- They don't live in a world where yeah. their ethnicity is part of the- It's a given. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a given. It's when, when you wake up, and I don't mean to sound obnoxious, but when you wake up, you don't have to worry about what it means to walk into a building in general. That's something I have to think about every day. And I'm Reverend Dr. Carter with two <laughs> doctorate degrees and 12 books. Yeah. I have to be aware every single day of what I look like. This is a part of the reason why I both wear bow ties every day. I can't be a threat wearing a bow, <laughs> wearing a bow tie. <laughs> I mean, and, and so I, I'm making fun of it right now, but that is it's something legitimate. I mean, I have, my daughter is 16 and it's something that she has learned about me is that I don't make fast movements. I don't get loud. I speak yeah. very slowly. I speak very intentionally. So no one will ever, whatever this about me. And again, that's even in Christian context. I walk into a room where, you know, for the particular denomination that you and I both serve in, um, as, as, as I don't want to use the word liberal, but as open hearted as they are and as affirming as they are and all those things, if I walk in and I look a very particular way, people are going to wonder who I am and why I'm there and their antennas are going to go off. And that's just a part of the human nature that we have. Yeah. Yeah. You've talked a lot about kind of, you know, understanding the, the history of why we've gotten here. And this is a big topic right now, kind of in the kind of cultural vernacular. Like we hear things like, you know, people yelling at school board meetings about critical race theory. And, and um, uh, you know, they, uh, they, they, first of all, like very few people can actually define what critical race theory is. So, and so what I was going to say, strange, that's, what a strange, that's the red herring. Like, yeah, what a strange, like, uh, obscure legal theory that has now become, you know, this boogeyman for a lot of people. But Tyler, um, that's the point of when people get uncomfortable, they find something to push back against. And it doesn't have to even make sense because the people that they're talking to are not going to try to think critically about it. Mm -hmm. They're going to go with emotion. They're going to go with whatever their fear is. They're going to go with whatever the boogeyman is. And they know that enough people are just going to listen because they are also afraid that nobody's going to even try to figure out what really is going on. Critical race theory is a, an, a, an academic theory that has been in existence since how long? For 30, 40 years. Yeah. And nobody's ever found a problem. With, well, I mean, it gets its, uh, you know, there are debates about it in academia, but not until black and brown people start to fully push back against Trumpism and all those different kinds of things, does that now become something that is a talking point that we can deflect to and make that the boogeyman and make anyone who believes in it or who doesn't um, discount it into the enemy. Yeah. Yeah. So what are, what are some of those, um, you know, specifically in church context, you, you know, you, you have a whole chapter on sort of the historical context of, 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 you know, the black experience in the United States. And, uh, you know, t walk me through a couple of those highlights that especially within the church world, you talk about in the chapter that you think it's important for everybody to grasp, you know, th this is part of what has led us to this point. Well, 
So I can't have this conversation without using the word power, but I want to use it respectfully, or I hope that people understand what I mean when I use it. Um, so let's think about it. Black and brown people were brought to this nation for a very particular reason, and Christianity was introduced to them to control them, plain and simple. It wasn't about saving their souls primarily. It was about controlling them and instilling the fear of God in them and Christianizing this, you know, this uh, animalistic culture. And we have to understand how that affects the relationship that we have today. And I, I, I may not be answering the question in the way that you were intending, but it's, we have to recognize that power is important and power has been used over generations. Now it has not been used necessarily as the way that it did back in the Jim Crow days, all those different kinds of things. But we have to begin to recognize the validity of the black and brown experience, not just politically, but even theologically. Think about it. You and I both went to seminary. Uh, think about all the best-selling biblical and theological writers or what we believe is the right, the correct theology. It all comes from white men. It doesn't come from women, let alone black or brown women, but it doesn't come from women. It doesn't come from black men. And for the few that do break through, they use the same language, they use the same whatever that the white men that train them use. So there is no uh, I don't want to use the word dissension, but there is no opposing or variant view. So the question is, what does all of this mean? If we are saying that we are the church, that we all we see all people as created in God's image, then what does it mean for this one group, this one particular group to be the ones in charge of what it means to be Christians and for that to be lived out on a daily basis? That's the thing that I've been thinking about the most, especially after writing that particular book and the other ones that have come since then. Hmm. Yeah. So, you know, none of us, like there's no such thing as a, as an interpretation that's mm -mm. pure. Like no, we, all, it all, we all have a lens. So just in the last month, uh, why am I forgetting this theologian? It was somebody like, it wasn't Calvin, but it was somebody of Calvin's uh, pedigree and status. Uh, John Calvin, for those who may not know who I'm talking about, uh, you know, a bastion of, you know, early uh, 20th, uh, whatever century Christianity in the United States and, and in Europe, come to find out this man has, he owns slaves. <laughs> so this soul salvation and this freedom and this grace and this all these things that he preached about, he didn't practice that with his own slaves. He didn't practice that with another group of human beings. And again, it wasn't John Calvin. Give me a minute. I remember who it was. Was it but what uh, do, Edwards, Jonathan Edwards? I think it was. Yeah. And so what does that mean? You know, do we just throw Jonathan Edwards out? No, I'm not saying that we throw Jonathan Edwards out, but we have to view what he taught in us, you know, it, through a particular lens now that we know these things about him. But again, the bigger point is, is who is worthy to be in leadership? Who is worthy to be trusted? Who does God speak through? Does God only speak through you know, people from a particular time that from a particular place with a particular pedigree, let alone again, race or gender, or does God continue to speak through anyone who believes, who trusts and who seeks to be filled with the Holy Spirit? All right. So, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to, I'm going to, there, there might be somebody who is viewing this conversation mm -hmm. And they hear you and I talking about some of the really harmful and divisive things that have happened in history. And their response is, well, the only thing that's divisive is y'all bringing this up. And so help. So what I want you to do is walk me through why acknowledging these things we're talking about actually leads to healing rather than this like, uh, you know, why can't we all just get along sort of ethereal sense of unity? Because it does not acknowledge the lived experiences of other people. It also positions your life experience as the predominant or the one that only one that really matters. It, it says that my life experience 
doesn't matter and that I should just get on board with whatever it is you say. That may not be what a person intends, but that's how it come acro comes across. Mm. So um, I have to recognize that my lived experience is not the same as everyone else's. But that's the reason why I ask the questions and engage in conversation. And I personally ask the question, okay, how do we make this better? And these are the principles that I believe are taught in the Bible in the first place. I mean, think back to the New Testament. Uh, and to the writings of Paul. Paul tells us to be reconciled with our brothers and sisters, to, uh, to value them more than we value ourselves, and to try to understand them and to bring about healing. But the reason why it's important is, is because, again, um, your experience is not the only experience, and your position is not the only experience. And an inconvenience does not make someone else wrong or engaging in tough conversation doesn't make somebody else wrong mm. and it doesn't make you a bad person either because again i'm not attacking anyone in particular but to avoid having these conversations opens up the opportunity for the things that happened in the past to continue to happen right now and we have examples upon examples of that continuing not just again in society, but in churches as well. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about scripture. Um, I, I read a book a couple of years ago called The Genesis of Liberation. Mm -hmm. And it was about um, when it was about when slaves were preached to, um, they would they would, you know, the you, you, the masters would literally pay people to go and preach to their slaves, but there were stipulations. They had to preach from, what was it, Ephesians 6? That There were specific passages. In you fact, they preach found, about... You, well, they found Bibles for, the, for uh, you know, some of the slaves who could read, they were given Bibles, but the book of Exodus was That's exactly what I was about gone. to say. You cannot preach liberation to them. You cannot preach that God would free them. Uh, I think I talk about this in the book as well, that uh, for slaves or for, uh, you know, African-Americans, Black people at the time who wanted to be baptized, they had to sign documents that said, I was, you are not becoming a Christian and you don't want to be a baptized because you're trying to be free from slavery, that you understand that your salvation of this act, this public act of baptism or confession of faith in and God and in Jesus was not going to change your life circumstances, yeah. that you would be okay with being a slave and being treated whatever way your master decided to treat you. Yeah. And so, you know, what I, what I worry about is when churches are uncomfortable with having these kinds of conversations, that there is an aspect uh, like, on, on a on a pastoral and a theological level, there is a whole aspect of discipleship that we are completely ignoring. Yep. Have you seen that too? I am. Uh, again, it's so our theology has become a theology of convenience. Like, don't challenge me to any real deep life change. So one of the things I talk about is the fact that our faith has been politicized. Don't try to preach a theology or a gospel that does not fit into either Republican or Democratic worldview versus the gospel changing our political worldview and causing us to live differently or to live outside of those camps. Uh, unfortunately, uh, so I wrote it, I'm sorry, here I go mentioning another book. Uh, I wrote a book <laughs> called Untying Bootstrap Theology, Gospel of Generosity and Justice. It went, and in that research that I conducted for that book, uh, we are a biblically illiterate generation. Literally, we are a biblically illiterate generation. Uh, we will say, we will regurgitate what a politician has told us, the Bible says, versus going to see what it says. Now, I'll give you an example. The pastor of a predominant or uh, of a very influential church in Texas uh, was in an interview and uh, a commentator said to him, but you're supposed to turn the other cheek. And this pastor said, I'm not supposed to turn the other cheek. There's nowhere in the Bible. And it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> Jesus specifically said, turn the other cheek. And this pastor was like, well, I don't have to do that. But it was in a context of a, you know, it was politically motivated. Mm. This 
pastor's theology is clearly about politics first versus faith first, or they have confused what it means to be, they have confused faith and politics uh, and, and, and mixed them up, un unfortunately, in a, a, a bad way. But the bigger point again is, number one, we don't read our Bibles. For those of us who claim to be Christians, we don't read our Bibles in general. We listen to what somebody else tells us and the world that we get our information from is extremely small. I'm not even gonna go through the, the short list of the television programs or stations that people watch, but it's less than five. And they all have an agenda and none of them is a kingdom agenda. Let's just be truthful about that. It's an agenda to make money, to keep people separated in order to continue to make money, whether that uh, station is on the right or the left. It's not about biblical fidelity. And we've lost this desire to be biblically faithful. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and, and anything that makes us uncomfortable, we label as political or there you we go. label as divisive. Yep. Um, you Even know. though it's exactly what Jesus told us to do. Right, right. Let's, let's take another example. Yeah. Let's take two more examples. That I'll try to tie together really quickly. That I give this example on a regular basis and people, it's hard for people to refute this. In the Old Testament, back to this Exodus idea, when God had Israel or God's children on the verge of entering the promised land and then they finally entered the promised land, God clearly told them that when you enter this promised land, don't forget what your life was like before this. Mm. Don't forget that you were once slaves yourself. Don't forget that you were once foreigners in a strange land and people treated you bad. So when you get into this new land, treat people the right way. And one of the ways to do that is, is to welcome them in and give them an opportunity to become part of your family. The other thing is don't keep all your resources to yourself. When you uh, till the fields and you know bring in grain and all those different kinds of things, don't go to the outskirts. Leave enough on the outskirts for women or for widows. Refugees. For and what do we do now? No, refugees can't get anywhere near us. We don't want them here. We are a nation that only takes care of itself. And we're a Christian quote unquote nation. And we don't, we ignore that. And Jesus said the exact same thing. Don't forget what God has told you. God has said it is more important or as important to take care of other people. Don't hoard your resources. Don't treat other people like enemies. Don't treat the foreigners or the refugees like they are an inconvenience because they will be here and it's part of your responsibility, your privilege to treat them like they were created in God's image and we treat them like they're an inconvenience. That's just literally one example of our, uh, our failure to, to either read or understand or apply the clear, simple teachings that we find in this book that we say we believe. Yeah, gosh, good stuff. And, and I, I want to remind everybody who's watching live to like, please, you know, ask questions in the comments. We want to provide space in these conversations that matter to talk about things that can be difficult. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm so uh, thankful that Terrell is uh, one of somebody who I trust implicitly to, to come and be both firm and gentle. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful for you. So, uh, so if you have any questions, have any comments, please put them down and, and I'll try to get to them. But, you know, this is a, we've kind of already talked about this, but, uh, you know, I want to ask you, Terrell, like what, what does, how, how do you see the gospel and racial reconciliation being brought together? Uh, because so often I think people want to separate those. And sometimes you'll hear people say, well, I just like it when people preach the Bible. And what they, we need, we need more of the gospel. We need less of this other stuff. Right, right. And I think what I hear you saying is that's a false dichotomy. It is. And there's an irony for me because I'm preaching through a series called The Gospel According to Motown. <laughs> <laughs> and, and last summer, I preached through a series called The Gospel According to Broadway. And at the church where I serve as pastor, I, there's been some rumblings about not rumblings, but there have been a couple of statements about, hey, we want to do, we want you to do country music. So apparently I'm going to do a series mm. called The Gospel According to Country Music next. Um, so we, we boiled the gospel down into this formula that the gospel is, you know you're a sinner and you 
you feel sorry for your sin and you don't want to go to hell. So you accept Jesus as your savior and you go to heaven and everything's all right. And the rest of your life is built around this idea of I need to get ready to go to heaven. And that is, I won't say that's the wrong, that's an incomplete gospel. There's a, there's a kernel of truth in that. So the word gospel means good news. That's what it means. And it usually means the good news that comes when a king or someone in authority has conquered or has, you know, fully exercised their power. That's what the gospel means. The good news that says this person is making life better for everyone else. Let's go enjoy it. And so that good news is found in the Old Testament. That's where it begins. And it's the good news of God's love. So God created humankind, uh, something went wrong, and God said, I'm not going to let this remain. I am putting into place, or I have a plan where I'm going to restore the relationships with not just these human, but with all of creation. That's what the gospel is, in my understanding. Mm -hmm. It is the full picture of God's love for everyone and everything that God has created. And so if God loves everyone and everything that God has created and everything that God created, God called good, then we can't pick sides on who we think is worthy to be saved or to be in relationship with God. Everyone is worthy to be saved or to be in relationship with God. And God desires the best for all of them. And so I think that when we boil this down to a formula that nobody can ever you know, define, well, we can define it, but when we boil it down to a formula that, oh, you know, it's an escape plan, that's not the true gospel. The true gospel is, in my mind, if I'm understanding scripture correctly, and Hebrew culture that that scripture came out of, is that God wants everyone and everything to be reconciled, not just to God, but to each other as well. And so we have the privilege of participating in that process. So whether it's race or gender or economic status or whatever, part of our privilege is, is to try to come together with everyone and everything that God has created in order for God to be pleased. Yeah, on Wednesday nights right now, we're going through Ephesians. And we're, I mean, we're, we're going like phrase by phrase like it is old school expository kind of stuff and so you know in chapter one paul talks about how god god's ultimate dream is to bring together heaven and earth that you know that that sense of unity and he does he talks about the traditional things that i think we all would associate with okay well this is the gospel which is i was a sinner mm -hmm. god's grace gave me a path out of that heaven and earth is brought together in my soul. Like, absolutely. We all affirm that. Paul then goes on to say, and how does this look like in your community? Wow. You know, where is that sense of unity? Where's that sense of heaven and earth being brought together? And again, he is preaching, speaking, writing, whatever, to a group of Jews and Gentiles it's which, completely different backgrounds. Which we 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 are so I'm gonna speak for myself. Like I did not grow up hearing that those were the, that was ethnicity. You know, like we I was taught the Bible, I think, growing up in a way where we never talked about that those were ethnic differences. Mm -hmm. But that's exactly what he's talking about. You mentioned Galatians a lot in the book. Yep. And specifically Peter, who struggled, you know, he, he, he eats with the Gentiles and then folks come from Jerusalem and Peter's yeah. like, uh, never mind, I shouldn't have done right. that. And Paul calls him on the carpet because of it. Yeah. It, but again, it's this expediency and let's acknowledge that Peter, we all know that Peter was not perfect, but it's the expediency of, oh, I want to try this. This is cool. But then when the people from the my home team come in, then I change how I interact. And that doesn't please God. That disappoints God. Uh, but also, I want to just pick up on, you know, this idea of heaven and earth. Again, we have made the idea of the gospel something about just going to heaven. If we read Revelations correctly, or not correctly, if we read Revelations the way it probably was intended, 
we understand that like heaven is not our ultimate destination. It says that God brings heaven and earth, like you just said, together. And if I remember in Revelations correctly, it says that we are all here on earth together, that God and that Jesus are the light and that everything is happening here and God recreates everything and it turns into what God fully intended in the very beginning. So we, that's a, it, my challenge or my frustration is we make that as our get out of jail free card, like, eh, I'm not supposed to really worry about what's happening here on earth. We just need to worry about people's soul salvation to get them away to this other place. But Jesus talks about consistently, like Paul, as you just outlined, what does it look like on a daily basis in the here and now? That's what's important. We don't disregard that there's an afterlife, but what's most important is how are you treating people right now? How are you imaging God or how are you being God's image to people right now? Okay, so, uh, you know, you, a lot of, a lot of churches that are predominantly white, but who, who also want to move in the direction of being the kind of place where topics like racial reconciliation can be talked about, where it's part of discipleship, you know, I think people feel stuck. They don't know what to do. Um, and I also think that they struggle with, okay, well, are we supposed to like fit a certain quota, you know? Um, and t talk, t tell me about what does it look like when a church is open to the Holy Spirit in leading them in this direction, regardless of whether anybody else joins the church or not? So one of the first things I always try to say is, is that just because there is not racial diversity or ethnic diversity in a congregation doesn't make that a bad place. So nobody should ever feel guilty about that. If you live in a town, your church or whatever it is, is located in a town of 3000 white people, and there are only 100 black people, there's probably not going to be a lot of diversity. So but diversity means so much more than just race and ethnicity. It means economic status. It means ability level, it means all these other things as well. So I try not to get hung up only on race and ethnicity, but for a congregation that does want to try to do that, uh, number one, uh, one of the first things they have to acknowledge is it is going to be a tough road because not everyone is going to want to do that. Mm. Um, and number two, it's going to make you uncomfortable when you invite people who are different from you into your space and they come with their own ideas they come with their own lived experiences they come with their own preferences or whatever it is that's going to challenge you to give up i used the word power earlier that's going to challenge you to give up power and comfort and that is not a nice feeling or necessarily a nice experience and so how do we get prepared for those things and again, that discomfort doesn't make you a bad person or make you a bad congregation. It just means that uh, one of the things that it could mean is that this is something that you need to work on and that you need to be aware of. So those are two really simple things. But if you want to uh, embrace this idea of diversity, again, that's going to require that you allow other people to come in and to help influence whatever it is that's occurring. Um, you know. Uh, so let's not even talk about just African Americans. Let's talk about just black and brown people in general. If you want uh, people from an African context to come in, then you may have to get used to people wearing certain clothes or, you know, certain kinds of music being played or even a different interpretation of scripture. Let's talk about that in general. Uh, when you are uh, trying to make sure that your leadership is diverse between men and women, women may have a different way of looking at scripture than uh, traditional, traditionally that a man would. Um, there's uh, a book that I just purchased called The Women's Lectionary, and it's by an African-American professor named Will Gaffney, who's an outstanding uh, biblical scholar, just plain and simple. But uh, she talks about how we read scripture from a male-centric point of view and what does that mean for our interpretation but when you start opening up to women then that opens up to things that we have may have never thought about before in you know in particular context so those are just some of the things that we have to be aware of yeah. there's no formula though and again number one 
just because there's not necessarily diversity doesn't make a congregation bad. But if a congregation wants to be open to it, then they have to be ready to be uncomfortable in multiple different ways based on who they are trying to invite into you know, their space or who they're willing to allow to come into their space. I hate to even use that phrase willing to allow, but who they're inviting to come into their space. Who they ex extend welcome. That's yeah. probably a better way of saying it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so one more reminder to anybody, like if you wanna ask any questions or anything, go ahead and in the comments, uh, send those. Um, because, you know, one of the things that I see as a pastor, and I've, I've written about this in my blog to the church, and I've talked about it in front of groups and stuff, is they're also, and I'm going to speak in generalities, uh, you know, and, and I, I hate to do this, but I think there, there can be at times also a generational divide yeah. where folks, oh gosh, I hate generalities like this because I can already think of people who don't fit this mold, but folks who maybe tend to be older, they want to come to church and they want to escape from all of these topics that they see on the news. They want, they want the church to be unsullied by all of this stuff that they see out in the world. And that's a, le that's a legitimate thing to feel and a legitimate thing to want. But at the same time, folks who are younger and who are hungry uh, for Christ, hungry for the gospel, they tend to come into a church and they are wondering, what does this place have to say about everything that's going on in the world? You know, if we are willing to be honest about scripture, it does say something about almost everything in the world. I mean, so think about it. It talks about mental health. It talks about, uh, you know, blended family. It talks about things, you know, between genders. It talks about things between race. We can't get away from it. And what we have tried to do though is, is to soften the stories or to make them so general that they won't be, they won't offend anyone. But I think you're right that this newer generation recognizes that uh, this faith that we claim is supposed to make a difference in so many different ways. And they are looking for that to be true or they're looking to see the evidence of that, not just on Sundays, but every day during the week as well versus this escapism that you that you talked about yeah and i think and and to the to the credit of the older generation i do think that sometimes they they have a way of recognizing where people do sometimes tend to bring maybe ideologies of the world into right. their faith rather than their faith affecting the way that they view the world and, and yeah. to so to the older generation's credit i think that there's a there's a kernel of truth in that suspicion that they feel um, and i want to make sure it doesn't seem like i'm castigating anyone yeah 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 it, it but it is again one of the frustrations i have just as a christian and how much i interact with people and how much i get pushback and pushback is good so I don't, i'm not saying don't push back but, you know, when you ask the question of where this pushback comes from, it comes from a different kind of place versus this, like the suspicion trying to make sure that people are not overgeneralizing, but it comes back, it comes from something else. Yeah. yeah. And many times, excuse me, many times it comes from something else. Yeah. And I mean, we're afraid. Yeah. We're afraid of, we're afraid of uh, this kind of, this sort of tenuous, uh, comfort and unity that we kind of feel we're afraid that that divisive topics are going to somehow mess with that and so therefore we just don't talk about anything but they're, they're um, supposed to though <laughs> right 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 yeah yeah they're supposed to yeah. and just because you have discomfort and just because you have disagreement doesn't mean anyone's evil it doesn't mean anything is wrong we're all humans yeah that's part of the thing i think that we forget we are all humans and we are working through what it means to be humans and we will not be perfect until we're no longer living. I mean, yeah. I'm not trying to be, you know, obnoxious when I say that, but we're going to offend people. We're going to misunderstand people. We're going to have, we're going to do, we're going to say, we're going to whatever. It's because that's part of what our nature is. The privilege we have is to work through those tough times to try to 
communicate even more clearly to sometimes say, I'm sorry, I got this wrong. I didn't realize, mm. help me better understand. And I'll try to do better next time, but I still love you. And I still want to be God's image to you and God's comfort to you as well. And for you to say the same thing to me. Yeah. So my, my friend Andy asked a question that I think is worth exploring. He asked, why does a person have to be ready to be uncomfortable with, the, with diversity? He says, that's a generality that may not be valid with many people in a congregation. He says, personally, I am thrilled to see new people come in who are different than me. I do not think I'm alone in this thought. And I Ask celebrate the, that. Say the first part again. He says, why does a person have to be ready to be uncomfortable with diversity? Because, and, and finish the rest of it. I want to make sure that I'm hearing what he's saying. He says, why does a person have to be ready to be uncomfortable with diversity? He says, that's a generality that may not be valid with many people in a congregation. I think okay. what Andy is saying is that he doesn't feel uncomfortable with diversity. Um, and, and I would say that Andy is probably in the minority uh, yeah. or not in the minority. Let me say it this way. Not everyone feels the way that Andy does. I so I appreciate Andy's stance. And so I'm not being a smart aleck. I think that not everyone feels like Andy does. Uh, again, this is not just me saying, so you, both of us are academics in our own way and both of us read data, all those different things. The data tells us that people don't like change and they rather be with people who are just like them. So for Andy to say what he said shows that he is probably on the outside of that, meaning he's not like everyone else. And I'm again, I'm not saying that Andy's better or worse. I'm not saying that someone else is better or worse. What I'm saying is, is when you have honest conversations with people, they acknowledge that they prefer being with like-minded people who look like them or who have similar life experiences, who believe the same thing that they believe up and down the spectrum. And when that is challenged or when someone comes in who doesn't think the same thing or has a different view on whatever, then there's not just a certain level of discomfort, there's a certain level of distrust, all those different kinds of things. But again, that's part of who we are as humans. So I appreciate Andy and I appreciate his question, but I think that Andy's probably different, you know, so let's- Andy's let's, different, all right. <laughs> Andy, Andy, Tyler Andy. said that I didn't. Tyler said that I didn't. <laughs> well, I, I think too, uh, Andy, I mean, I agree with Terrell. I think that not everybody feels that sense of comfort with diversity. Um, I think if you do have that sense of comfort, then you are probably called to help be a leader in a congregation to help spread that comfort to help right. spread that 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 sense of celebration um, are we are we acknowledging andy a call that andy may not understand that he already has that's right for i know the plans <laughs> i have for you andy so and again i want to make sure that someone who does not have the same outlook as andy we're not saying that they're wrong either we're not right. saying that they're bad people either the question is how do we open ourselves up to you know different experiences uh, again, not just around race and ethnicity, but in, I'll give another example. The first church that I was called to serve as pastor was a small congregation in South St. Louis. Um, and we eventually had a, a ministry to older adults who were developmentally disabled. So mm. older adults who were from 20 to 50 years old, but who had the mentality of a five to six year old. Can you imagine what that's like trying to navigate that? But that became a specific ministry that our congregation leaned into. And not only did we serve those people, we served their relatives as well. And I can't tell you how many wonderful stories we have. I baptized, I think, seven of them in one day, oh, you know, at one morning yeah. service. And it was like a, the price is right. You baptize one of them, they get up and you come tell them next time. Come, exactly. Come on down. And, you know, you do that seven times in a row. And some people would say, why would you do that? They are not even fully developed. They have the mentality of, well, no, it doesn't matter. Their faith was simple, but they had that in their hearts. But it also, uh, you know, not saying that it was easy, um, 
but it was worthwhile. And that's another form of diversity. Again, it's not based on ethnicity, it's not based on gender or economics, it's based on develop, developmental level. And we believed that we were wholeheartedly called by God to embrace that community and to welcome them. And so they had their own choir every other Sunday. They served as ushers with the help of some other adults who were supervising them. And they felt welcome and they were made a part of our community. It was one of the great joys of my time there. Wow. Yeah. Well, you were affirming God's image within them. Yes. Who am I to say anything different? Yeah. Wow. Well, Terrell, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, thank you for um, leading us further down the road of discipleship, because in the end, that, that's what all of this is about, is we want to follow Jesus. We yeah. want to follow Jesus wherever Christ is calling us, even though it may lead to some uncomfortable roads. That's exactly what it means to take up your cross, right? Yep, it yeah. does. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate the conversations you and yeah. I have. And blessings to you and the congregation you serve and to any of the people that are listening. My hope is, is that uh, we would image uh, God's love to the entire world and that we would receive that as well when it's imaged to us by other people. Yeah. Terrell, do you mind to close us with a word of prayer? Yeah, please. God, we are always thankful for our opportunities to just to struggle and to navigate life, to struggle with what it means to be human and to seek to be your hands, feet, your image in this world. Uh, God, we are thankful that you are patient with us and we are extremely thankful, obviously, that you love us and that uh, you have um, reconciled us to you. And so I pray, Lord, that each of us would seek to follow your lead and to follow your example uh, by loving others unconditionally, uh, by utilizing all that we have and that we are to make the world a better place. And Lord, not just for ourselves, but for other people, because that's what you would have us to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you, Terrell. Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry, they can't see I'm saluting. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> see you, man. Peace. Bye.